All right, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter number 24 as we continue um, the story of Paul's all-expense-paid vacation trip to the city of Rome. We're on page 273 in our notebooks, if you, are, if you have one and you'd like to follow along. Let's look down through the introduction here to chapter uh, 24. Everyone who has ever tried his luck at any sort of gardening knows the very real nature of the weed problem. You cultivate the land, plant your flowers or vegetables, you wait patiently to enjoy the fruit of your labor, yet mysteriously, almost overnight, other plants, we call them weeds, take root, threatening to invade and starve the garden. It's funny, though, because really, what is a weed? It's not a weed. It's not a weed the same thing as any other plant in the sense that it grows up from the ground and survives in the ground. When does a plant become a weed? For the most part, a plant becomes a weed when it grows in a place where it is not <laughs> welcomed. In this way, a dandelion is not welcomed in a rose garden, so it is labeled a weed. Conveniently, labeling the plant as a weed grants permission to the herbivores, and soon it is quietly but forcefully removed from the soil. What do weeds have to do with anything? This is how Paul was viewed in the eyes of Israel's religious leaders. Paul was referred to as a pestilent fellow. He was a weed. He was a blight. A pestilence when referring to non-human things as a disease, a plague, a troublemaker that when introduced into a population is a source of menace and chaos. The word pestilence when referring to humans often carries with it the idea of a public enemy. Paul was referred to as an enemy of the public. Further, not only was Paul a public enemy, but he was a seditious man, one who incited people to disorder, and even more ghastly, he was one who polluted the most holy place. Well, anyway, we understand that Paul the Apostle was not favorably looked upon by the Jewish culture of his day. Although many, 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 we read throughout the book of Acts, had come, Jews had come to know Christ as Savior, the vast majority of the population had not. They had rejected the gospel story. They rejected the grace of God revealed through the Messiah. They rejected the message of Paul and his apostles and other Christians in the first century. It was a using the King James word tumult. It was a very tumultuous um, century for the Christian church. We see an outline there of chapter 24 on page 273. Tertullus presents the case against Paul before Felix. We know that, um, that Paul now has moved from the custody of Claudius Lysias. He's been moved to the governor's uh, custody, Felix. And now Tertullus is an orator, it appears to be, a paid, trained lawyer, orator, whatnot, to come and confront Paul the Apostle before Felix. They've hired this fellow who's got the gift of gab. He knows how to be persuasive in what he says because they are bent on eliminating the weed, eliminating this pestilent fellow, this disease, this blight from among them. So let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter number 24. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always and in all places, most notable Felix, with all thankfulness. This is called, in the original Greek, brown nosing. You understand what I'm talking about there. He's setting them up. He's making them, he's, uh, making them feel good to get him on his side. Notwithstanding, 
that I be not further tedious unto thee. I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man, Paul, a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who also hath gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. So it takes five days for Ananias and the Jewish elders to get to Caesarea for the hearing before Felix. During this time, the elders have hired a professional, Tertullus, to present the case before Felix. He began to accuse him. And of course, he begins by flattering the governor. It's a good way to do it. As I noted in the notes, Edmund Burke said, flattery corrupts both the receiver and the giver. Flattery essentially is a lie, is what it is. <laughs> I mean, let's just call it what it is. Most noble Felix, more malarkey, I be not further tedious, tiresome, monotonous, or dull, etc. He's using all these terms to, to pull Felix onto his side. They found him to be a pestilent fellow. He's guilty of sedition, inciting people to rebel or revolt, a mutiny. He is a leader of a sect. All of this stuff essentially is or are exaggerations trying to make their case. And that's, uh, if you listen to politicians, if you listen to lawyers, uh, that's kind of what their, it, it seems what their job or their position is, that they're going to exaggerate whatever their position is, or they're going to exaggerate the negative of the position of the person opposing them. So um, a number of things, obviously, he is accused of here. Picking up the story in verse 10, chapter 24, verse 10, Paul presents his defense. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem and for to worship. This situation that you have to deal with right now, Felix, is 12 days old, okay? And 12 days ago, this is what I did. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Anybody can say anything about anybody. Prove it. There's no proof of these accusations. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. So everything that Paul is saying here, there's, this is not a civil disagreement. It's not a civil argument. In fact, these people can't prove anything uh, that they've accused me of. And basically, here's my story. So you listen to what I have to say. Resurrection of the just and unjust. And herein... Do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void to offense toward God and toward men? Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, 
neither with multitude or with tumult. I wasn't in the temple creating a problem for anybody who ought to have been here before thee and object. Nobody said anything 12 days ago, did they, if they had ought against me? Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me, while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question by you this day. This is what the issue is. This is what the issue is. The issue is the resurrection of the dead. Orthodox Judaism believes in the resurrection of the dead. And that's all I'm talking about. Of course, the references to Christ, that Christ rose from the dead. The, the Old Testament scriptures teach resurrection of the dead. So now, Paul isn't getting into the theological details of all of this because frankly, this Roman governor doesn't really care and doesn't understand either. He doesn't understand and he doesn't care. And the governor is sitting there probably wondering by this time, why are all of these people here? What am I? Why have you made me a judge of your religious theological differences? So that's what's going on here in, in the governor's mind. So, um, Paul says, I'm not a troublemaker. I simply went to Jerusalem to worship. And there's absolutely no proof of these accusations. And Paul is suggesting that a mere 12 days, five of them spent in Caesarea, and seven of them fulfilling a vow, that there was no time to organize an insurrection. So I, I, I'm not trying to create this tumult, this insurrection against anybody. This I confess, that after the way, so worship I. So again, here's his opportunity, the way. What is the way? And we've seen that phrase several times. A couple more are mentioned here in the text of 24 in verse number 14. So again, this is a religious issue for which I am accused. I'm merely following the scriptural expectations in hopes of the people of Israel. That's all I'm doing. So Paul is really pounding this home. This isn't a civil issue. I didn't come here to create a riot or a tumult. These people are the people that have created the riot and the tumult because they don't like what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is really the core issues of their religion, and they object to it. In verse number 19, we quote, who ought to have been here before thee, Paul subtly implies, where are mine accusers and the eyewitnesses? In other words, the people that are here accusing Paul aren't necessarily the people who were actually there when all this event. These are the pros. They've come together to represent all of these other people to stand before the governor. Where are the people that really, that were present at this tumult, this riot that I created? Touching the resurrection, he says, I'm called into question. The only thing that they really have on me is my statement concerning the resurrection. This is a religious issue in nature. It's according to our sacred scriptures. And this is my crime. So Paul is uh, re representing himself pretty well here. He's uh, making the Jews making Tertullus look pretty bad at this moment. Felix then withholds judgment, 22. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. I want to hear what Lysias has to say about all of this now. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty or freedom, and that military term again, if you get a uh, 
24, 48, 96 hour pass, you are granted liberty. That means you're free to go off base and live your secular life, if you please. To have liberty in that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come into him. So he gives him perfect freedom here uh, to do what he wants to do. More perfect knowledge of that way. Felix was familiar with the way. And the reason is, is Drusilla, his wife, was a Jewess. He, no doubt, could see through the accusations leveled against Paul. In verse 23, keep Paul and let him have liberty. It's a minimum security environment with full visitation rights. So we pick up our reading in verse 24. 24, 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled, and, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. It is apparent that Felix is shaken by what Paul says. Paul spoke to him about righteousness, temperance, and self-control, and judgment to come. Felix knew something about this. This wasn't the first time that he had been exposed to this kind of language or these concepts or principles, particularly his wife was a Jewess. And we're going to assume that they've had conversations in the past uh, about some of these things. And, uh, of course, Felix wasn't dumb. He wasn't a stupid individual. He was a governor. He was probably well-educated and well-informed, had a good background, and Paul's preaching got to him. He fell under conviction. If you look on page 277, I write, in other words, Paul talked about what was morally correct, the importance of human responsibility, and final judgment. And all of these things said something to Felix himself. He trembled, verse 25 says. Felix responded this way, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. In other words, don't call me, I will call you. So uh, Paul is still in custody. This uh, situation, this, uh, this conflict has not been resolved at this point. So what is, what's the reason? Why doesn't Felix just kind of end this thing and get it off his uh, agenda. 24, 26, he hoped also. Oh, here we go. It's the answer to my question, isn't it? He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul. In other words, Paul, um, you, you know, you want to get out of this thing? I've got the power here to let you go. And, uh, you know, you, you could grease my palm a little bit and we'll settle this matter few dollars, a few drachma, rubies, whatever, lira, dinero, whatever it is, a little money would solve this problem for both of us. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. So he gave him several opportunities to make the suggestion like how about if i give you a little something would you let me go you know he didn't want to suggest because of his position to paul paul was a roman citizen he didn't want to suggest to paul that he bribe him but if paul made the suggestion then paul would be guilty first and if felix said well we could consider maybe a gift of a certain amount that might work. So Felix is not going to originate this financial agreement because he's not the ultimate and final authority. Paul, as a Roman citizen, 
could have him called in question for attempting to uh, solicit a bribe from him. So Felix is playing it safe here. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room. In other words, Felix retired out of his position, and a new pharaoh was in town. The new governor's name was Portius Festus, but there's some unfinished business. We've got a prisoner here named Paul. What is he here for? Portius Festus came to Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show a, a, the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So Paul never came up with an offer. Felix says, okay, I'm just going to keep you where you are. I'll keep you tied up. And the next guy, the next president of the United States, we'll just kick the can down the road here. We'll let the, let the next leader have to deal with this. I'm out of here. I'm done. I don't know if he retired, moved on to a new assignment, whatever it was, but we have a new uh, leader in town. We have a new individual who now has the uh, responsibility of dealing with Paul bound. He hoped also that money should be given him. Felix was obviously moved by Paul's testimony. However, like so many, his concern for other things overwhelmed his momentary conviction. What he could get out of Paul was more important than the gospel itself, monetarily. Felix sent for Paul often in hopes that Paul would try to strike a financial deal for his release. Felix was willing to show the Jews a pleasure, and, so, and, and consequently they left, or he left Paul bound. While Paul remained under guard, at least Felix was able to please the Jews by keeping Paul off the streets. There was some political currency in that until Paul would give Felix a payday. So he could use Paul to his own advantage. Portius Festus shows up here in the end. So if we turn the page, page 278, we finish up uh, chapter number 24. We're moving along quite quickly now as we come just reading the story, the narrative of the, uh, of the end of the book of Acts. The application, Paul is public enemy number one. He represents another kingdom. He represents another king. Paul reminds Felix that while he is governor, now he will face the king someday and give an account for his life. And Felix trembled. Tebow, still um, a figure that's uh, fairly well known in our culture. When, any, uh, when somebody like this publicly acknowledges the Almighty, he reminds everyone that there is one greater than all. The implication is that you'll stand before someone greater than me. When a fellow rounds third base and he's headed for home, he's just hit a home run, and he gives God the glory by pointing up, if that in, is indeed what he's doing, he's reminding everybody with that finger pointed up that there's somebody greater than all of those people in the stands. It's a um, good reminder to all of us. Felix's concern for money and political favor overshadowed his, tem uh, his trembling. So he puts off bringing a solution for a more convenient day. And a lot of people put off their conversion or their um, confession of faith in Christ as Savior. They put it off for a more convenient day. And then, unfortunately, sometimes we run out of days to do that. So we have some other things that uh, we've listed here on page 278. And we'll come to a conclusion of this uh, lesson right now, a little bit shorter than some of the others. But uh, again, we're moving along very, very quickly. We're talking about Paul as he uh, has been accused of creating an uproar in Jerusalem. He's ac accused unjustly. The Jews are trying to make, in some way, a civil case out of this. 
the Roman authorities don't see it, but they don't let Paul go. Paul is a Roman, and uh, now that no judgment is uh, to take place, we'll see shortly that Paul says, okay, I want to stand before the number one man. Send me to Rome. I'm appealing to Augustus Caesar to let me go. And the progression is just absolutely incredible. He gets a chance to preach to the Jews, the high priest, the elders of Judaism. He gets to preach to soldiers, many soldiers and chief captains, and then it's the governor, and then ultimately, and it's not written of in our scriptures, but we assume that Paul the Apostle actually had the uh, ultimate uh, opportunity to stand before the emperor of Rome, Augustus Caesar himself. Not recorded in the Bible, but we assume that to be true. So next time, in our next session, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 25. We're going to continue uh, studying Paul and his trip to Rome, his um, unexpected, all-expense-paid vacation in the city of Rome.